Hi everyone, I'm Amy Johnson Crow, and thank you so much for joining me this evening. We're gonna be talking tonight about a topic that has come up, and I really wanna give a shout out to Roberta Estes over at DNA Explained. She's the one who alerted me to something that could directly impact some of us and indirectly impact a lot of us because it's going to, I think it kind of brings to light some things that we all need to be thinking about. So what am I talking about? Well, tonight we're going to be diving into ancestry, roots web, and keeping our records safe. Now, as I said, Roberta Estes is the one who first uh, alerted me to this. She had blogged about this on her site. She had noticed something that um, was posted over on rootsweb.com. And that is that, let me get, the, uh, get this so you can see a little bit better. Over on rootsweb.com, you go to the main page and right now there are two notices. I'm gonna zoom in first on, on this big pink notice that's down at the bottom. And that is, note, World Connect family trees will be removed from RootsWeb on April 15th, 2023, and will be migrated to Ancestry later in 2023. So, the World Connect family trees, that has been around for a very, very long time, and they had been hosted over on what was called RootsWeb. Well, as we can see from, from this uh, notice here that they're going to be taken down from RootsWeb and they're going to be later this year integrated into Ancestry.com. Okay, well, that's not that big of a deal, all things considered. It's going to be just moving from one website into, um, into Ancestry itself. It's the other notice on this page that kind of worries me for a couple of reasons. I, should, I shouldn't say worry, I should say concerned. And that's the note up at the top, which I zoomed in a little bit, and it says, note, the Roots Web mailing lists will be shut down on April 6th, 2023. Now, as of the time that we're doing this live stream on February 23rd, that's what, six weeks from now, approximately? So what does this really mean for any of us? I know a lot of people before Roberta had first blogged about this and some of us started talking about it on social media, a lot of people are like, what is RootsWeb and why do I care that these mailing lists are, are being shut down? Well, let's take a little stroll down memory lane because I think it's important here to have a little bit of background, a little bit of context into what is really uh, being said here. So a little bit of a timeline because we're genealogists, we like timelines. So back in 1989, wow, that's a while back, 1989, the Roots Web surname list was launched. Okay, so that's 1989. A lot of people didn't even have computers yet, all right? It was still, I don't want to say a novelty, but it wasn't common that everybody had their own computer in their own home. But that was when RootsWeb first launched the surname list. And this was a way that people could exchange information about surnames that they were researching it was actually a really effective way of, of making those connections with, with distant cousins. Okay, so that's 1989. Let's fast forward a little bit to 1993, and that's when rootsweb.com was launched. And there were different parts to rootsweb.com. There were the, the surname list, which evolved into uh, lists about locations and topics. And as of, the time that we're talking about this right now, it ended up with more than 32,000 mailing lists. And again, that was for 
a bajillion different surnames. It was for locations, whether it was a country, a state, a county, and all sorts of genealogy related topics. Like I said, more than 32,000 of these mailing lists. RootsWeb also had World Connect family trees. They also provided a space where individuals and societies could actually host their own website. Again, this is the early to mid 90s and it wasn't as easy back then for individuals and small societies to really find a place to host their own website. So RootsWeb really filled a need that was in the community at the time. It wasn't, little fun fact here, it wasn't until 1996 that Ancestry.com was launched. Now Ancestry as a company existed before that, but they were a publisher. They published books and they published a wonderful magazine. I loved Ancestry magazine. It wasn't until 1996 though that Ancestry.com as a website providing genealogical data came to be. All right, so fast forward a little bit more to 2000 when Ancestry buys RootsWeb. Now things were working along, you know, fairly, fairly swimmingly for several years in fact. And then we get to 2017. And by this time, Ancestry had had RootsWeb for 17 years. And there was a data breach involving one of the RootsWeb mailing lists. Now, Ancestry identified the breach. They took care of everything. They fixed it, you know, did all the things that, that, a, that a responsible company needs to do when there's a data breach. So that happened in 2017. Well then fast forward a little bit more to 2020 and Ancestry turns off those mailing lists, all 32,000 of them. No longer could people send or receive emails through any of those 32,000 mailing lists. And some of those had been in existence since the very beginning, since 1989. Okay, so that's kind of where we are with the timeline of Ancestry with RootsWeb, specifically as it deals with the RootsWeb mailing lists. So I had reached out to Ancestry to get a little bit of clarification on what they meant by that message. And let me scroll back to it when they said that the RootsWeb mailing list will, will be shut down on April 6, 2023. Now, it's been almost three years since they shut off the ability to send and receive mail. So the only thing I can think of that they mean by shutting down the RootsWeb mailing lists is shutting down the archive. There is actually an archive of those 32,000 mailing lists. And let me see if I can find, here we go. Nope, hang on. There we go. So yeah, there were 32,000, as I mentioned, really almost 33,000 different genealogy mailing lists. And they're by surname, by topic, by location. It was incredible. And this archive of all of these emails that were sent and received through these, through these different mailing lists have been archived and they've been searchable. Think about that. Think about how many emails you get a day and imagine how many emails we're talking about here in this archive. Like I said, I reached out to Ancestry for clarification, but I haven't heard anything yet. But this is the only thing I can think of that they're doing is that they're getting rid of this archive of emails. Now you might be thinking, Amy, you just said that some of these mailing lists have been around since 1989. Why do I care about emails that were sent in 1989 or 1992 or 1998 or 2001? Why do I care? This is 2023. Why do I care about those emails? 
because those emails were how people were exchanging information. Yeah, sure, there's a lot of stuff in there now that is definitely outdated, like the emails from uh, that, that a society would send saying, hey, you know, we're going to have our monthly meeting next Tuesday. Okay, yeah, that's out of date. But then there are things like this, where people would transcribe records, like this one that had been sent to the Lowry uh, email list, the Lowry surname email list, as well as the Nova Scotia lists. And they are abstracting a family Bible. Now, I didn't capture it here on the screenshot, but at the bottom of this email was the person's name and mailing address. It also, these, these screenshots or the, these archived emails also show the email address that the person was using at the time. Now, admittedly, I do not use the same email address that I was using back in the 90s, back when I was using a CompuServe email address. I never had an AOL, I had CompuServe, but I, I do not use that email address anymore. So, but this is the type of record that if Ancestry is getting rid of the mailing list archive, it's this kind of information that's going to be lost. And that's really what, that's really what I want to talk about tonight is what do we do about this? You know, really, what, what can we do? I've seen some people say, well, let's start a petition. Well, sure, we can contact Ancestry and we can be all upset about it. But I'm not, and I'm, I'm trying not to be defeatist here when I say this, but I don't think that starting petitions or inundating Ancestry with, you know, emails and calling customer service and tagging them on social media, I don't know that that's necessarily going to do a lot of good. Again, not to be defeatist, but one, Ancestry has made this decision and Ancestry, okay, I, I pay for my Ancestry subscription. I use it almost daily, um, used to work there. I, I should throw that in as a caveat. I, I used to work there, but I don't, I don't think they're gonna change their mind on this. And the reason that I don't think they're going to change their mind on this, and I could be completely wrong, but if I had to guess, I suspect that the main reason that they are apparently going to get rid of the mailing list um, archive is something called tech debt. Now, tech debt is when you have some piece of technology and we all know technology changes. I mean, when I started using computers back way, way back in the day, we were exchanging information and putting information into our computers using five and a quarter inch floppy drives. Yeah. You know, if you had a computer that had a three and a half, wow, you, you were something. So yeah, my, my technology days go back quite a ways. So if you had something that was on a five and a quarter inch floppy, well, you get a new computer and all of a sudden it doesn't have that kind of drive. You, get, you have to find a way to get that five and a quarter inch floppy disk onto a three and a half and then eventually over into other formats, uh, in, other, in other media formats that became standardized, whether it then became, you know, moving it over to CD-ROM or, you know, storing more things on your hard drive because hard drive space became more plentiful. You also have to think about file formats. Not every program is going to, even if it's in the same program, 
if that file that was created, let's say Microsoft Excel, if you have a Microsoft Excel file from way, 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 way back, Microsoft Excel today may or may not be able to read it. And even if Excel can open it, is it going to faithfully reproduce that file? Is it going to be able to accurately get everything that was in that file? So we have to think about media. We have to think about file formats. We also have to think about the underlying infrastructure of whatever computer system. And that's gonna be everything from the operating system to what database you're using. All of those different things come into play. So what tech debt is, is when you have some piece of technology and you haven't maintained it, you haven't made those slow and steady upgrades all along. And then all of a sudden you buy a new computer in 2023 and you're rummaging through your closet and you find an old three and a half inch floppy disk. And it's like, you know, it, and it says on it, you know, family photos. Oh my gosh, I want to see these family photos. Well, you know, good luck. And that tech debt is both the time, it's the energy, it's the ability to migrate very old things into something that is current. And what I suspect has happened with the RootsWeb mailing list archive is that Ancestry has incurred tech debt, especially since it was a feature of Ancestry or I should say a component of Ancestry that especially after social media took off and especially after people started forming Facebook groups and people started exchanging more information that way, the mailing lists became less popular. They didn't go away. There were still societies and groups and individuals who used them, but they weren't as popular. So what I suspect has happened is that Ancestry has taken a look at this Roots Web mailing list archive and it's like, we can't maintain it. And we've incurred so much tech debt that we can't really afford to bring it up to where it needs to be to be part of what we offer. Even Ancestry does not have absolutely unlimited funds. So, you know, they have to think about, well, do we, do we modernize this database and this code that we have, this, this archive that we have of these old, you know, 32,000 mailing lists? Do we spend the time and resources and money to bring that up to where it needs to be? Or do we spend that money on digitizing and archiving or digitizing and indexing records that more of our paying customers could get use out of? So like I said, I don't know if that was their reasoning, but I, I suspect that that is it. So really, what does that mean for us? I think that there is, there is a lesson in all of this for all of us, whether we have ever used any of the Roots Web mailing lists. Um, I, I had some county lists that I just, I, I so enjoyed receiving those emails. Um, whether you ever use those mailing lists or whether you are hearing about these mailing lists for the first time this evening, there are lessons that we can take away from this. And the first I think really is we have to think about what it means for us to preserve our records. And I think that this is another reminder that we ultimately have to be responsible for preserving our own records. And I mean that in several different ways. I'm thinking about what are we doing about our paper files? I'm thinking about what are we doing about our computer files, but I'm also thinking about, you know, literally when we find something, say we find something on Ancestry and a lot of us have 
trees on Ancestry and it makes it very convenient that when you find a record on Ancestry, you just attach it to your tree. Well, that's all well and good, but what happens if Ancestry ever loses, um, if they lose the rights to those records? We see this on every website that's out there, whether it's Ancestry, whether it's Family Search, My Heritage, Find My Past, they all have to make agreements with those record holders. And those agreements are renewable periodically. And if at the end of a certain uh, renewal period that that record holder says, you know, we, we don't want you hosting those anymore. We don't want you making those available anymore. Well, Ancestry, Family Search, My Heritage, Find My Past, whoever, they have to take those images down. So just attaching things to our trees, our online trees, we should really be thinking of that as a convenience, not as a way of preserving what we find. It's much better to, when you find something, sure, go ahead and attach it to your, to your online tree, but also download a copy to your, for yourself and keep that copy for yourself on your own computer. The same goes with things that you find on individual websites. I was reminded just yesterday of Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. Beautiful cemetery. I mean, it is gorgeous. I love Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. And they used to have a wonderful website where you could plug in somebody's name and it would give you a digital image of the burial record. Oh my gosh, it was so cool because those burial records had so much information on them sometimes. It was so great. Well, fast forward to not that long ago, just in the last couple of years, they no longer offer that on their website. You can still search by name and it will show you in the cemetery where that person is buried, but to get a copy of the burial record, you have to contact Spring Grove Cemetery and pay them $5 a name. So if you had been doing a lot of research at Spring Grove Cemetery and you never downloaded any of those images that you found, because, hey, it's on that website, I can just always look it up again later. Well, now if you want a copy of it, you're gonna have to pony up five bucks a person. That can add up. So that's what I'm saying. We need to be responsible for when we find things, whether it's on Ancestry or a, you know some other website, make sure you're making a copy for yourself. But some other things that we need to be taken care of when it comes to preserving our own records is practice safe computing. Because if we have all of these records on our own computer, well, are we doing regular backups? Do we have multiple backups? Do we have not only a backup sitting here on an external hard drive on your desk, do you have another backup in the cloud somewhere? Think about something called locks, L-O-C-K-S-S, -S, locks. Lots of copies, keep stuff safe. Are you migrating? to fresh media and to fresh formats. Let me tell you, these, these wonderful little USB drives that we still pick up at conferences, even though my computer no longer has a USB-A, my computer now has one of those USB-C things. So if I want to read one of these, I need an adapter for it. These don't last forever. Trust me, these do not last forever. Also another fun fact, they don't go through the laundry very well. Just saying, don't ask me how I know. So don't, ooh. hopefully, you know, flinging them around in your office. <laughs> That's another thing that, that could end up going wrong. So don't think about these as being permanent. If you've had if you have files on one of these little portable little USB drives, whether it's one of these or whether it's like one of the little external hard drives, 
check those files periodically, see if they're okay. And if you have any files, honestly, that are on CD-ROM, remember how we used to all burn CDs and DVDs? It only takes one good scratch to render that entire CD useless. You've now made yourself a nice shiny coaster. So I recommend don't leave things on CD-ROMs. The, the, the failure rate on those is ridiculous. Which leads me up to my last point, and that is don't rack up tech debt. If you're going through some old files and you see, oh, I have a whole bunch of these old CDs, get those files off of those CDs get them onto fresh media, get them onto at least an external hard drive, do something. If you have a bunch of files floating around on these little USB thumb drives, at least get them over into a brand new one, <laughs> okay? But again, remember locks, L-O-C-K-S-S, lots of copies, keeps stuff safe. The more copies you have of something, the greater your chance that something will survive, okay? And we really need to be more mindful of the things that we're finding online. And what are we doing with that? What are we doing with those records? What are we doing with things that cousins email us? Well, are those email attachments just living in our email program? Okay, that's probably not the best place for them to live. Download them and get them into folders on your hard drive so that they can be part of your backup system so that you can get them backed up to an external hard drive. You can get them backed up to cloud storage. And yes, I do have both. You know, a lot of people say, well, where should I back up my data? My answer is yes, because yeah, I have, I'm, I'm looking at an external hard drive that I have here on my desk, and it's a piece of machinery. It could fail. That's why I have another backup up in the cloud. I don't recommend only having cloud as a backup because companies go out of business, or what if you need a file and you don't have internet access? So there are, there are some issues with, with cloud storage. So combining the two, chances are something is going to keep working. And I can see we have a bunch of comments. Let me see what, what came in, because I'm guessing that there are some questions. <laughs> Jennifer says, I still miss Ancestry Magazine. I do too, I do too. Yeah, and Sharon says that RootsWeb was the go-to place in the early years. It really was. It really was. Um, Dustin says, Amy, I, I saw on the Roots Web support page, it says the mailing list archives last updated in 2020. Well, and that's, that's when Ancestry turned off the ability to send emails to the mailing list. We'll be retired on 623 and migrated to an alternative free platform. Hmm. Once migration is complete, we'll provide a link to them on the Roots Web homepage. It would be nice if they would have said that on the Roots Web homepage. So just saying that on the Roots Web support page, I'm that gives me a little bit of hope, but I wonder what migrated to an alternative free platform means. Is it still going to be searchable? Is it going to be browse only? What does that mean? What does that look like? So I guess, um, and it says once migration is complete. Note that they don't give a date for that, but they did give a date for the World Connect Family Trees as being later this year, later in uh, 2023. Let's see, going through here. <laughs> Hazel says, I still run into my own Roots Web emails attached to other people's trees. Not often, but still. Yeah, I've seen that too. I've seen that. 
Uh, and Charlene asks a really good question. Can these pages be found on the Wayback Machine? Um, maybe some. I don't know how complete Internet Archives has done. Internet Archives is the organization that runs the Wayback Machine. I don't know how complete any um, any spidering or any crawl, that's the word I'm looking for, crawling, uh, any crawling that they've done on these. And honestly, um, I love Internet Archive. I, th I think they're wonderful, but sometimes searching on them can be a little tricky. Um, yeah, Melissa says, this brings back nightmares of a backup I thought I made years ago, did it wrong, and never could access the files. Oh, we, we've all done that. We've all done that. Uh, Genesis uh, supports the steps all researchers should take. If you find the information, download it, print it to PDF, take a screenshot, whatever it takes. Exactly. You know, and even if it isn't a situation like this where, where you have a major genealogy website taking down a collection or just one of those instances like we've seen um, you used to be able to get Chicago death certificates, but Chicago and or Cook County is like, no, we, we don't, we don't want to have those available. Those things happen. So make sure that you're taking it upon yourself to preserve your own record. So when you find something like Jenna says, download it, print it to a PDF, take a screenshot, what whatever, so that you know that you have a copy. You're not dependent upon Ancestry or Family Search or Spring Grove Cemetery to always have that record available for you. Um, Mary says, does this have does this have to do with Ancestry deleting quick links that appears on the home page? Now I believe that this is two different things. I think that Ancestry um, they keep saying that they're going to get rid of the quick links. Mine, mine were still there today. Um, that that's just a, a change in what they're doing uh, just with the layout of the Ancestry.com homepage. Uh, Heather says, I host a genealogy Facebook page for Campobello Island, New Brunswick. I have over 400 obituaries on there. My nightmare will be something happening to Facebook and people will no longer have access to them. Posting it to Facebook is a lot easier than posting to a web page, basically the click of a button. It's amazing though, Heather, uh, don't, don't sell yourself short on what you can do with a website or a blog. So many of them basically, if you can type or if you can drag and drop, you can publish. It has never been easier to create a website or create a blog. Um, don't sell yourself short, but you bring up a very good point. Yeah, all of us are now, we've, uh, most of us have migrated away from mailing lists for genealogy and now we're more reliant upon social media. What are we doing to preserve that information? Yeah, Rosalind says, I miss those Spring Grove records. I do too. I don't have family in Cincinnati, but my research takes me there uh, fairly regularly and not having those, yeah. Yeah, and, and Jim brings up a good point. Jim says, I'm still a hard copy guy. My computing goes back to 1981. You know, there is a lot to be said for paper. I mean, you... Paper doesn't, paper you can have what they call benign neglect. If I leave this stack of paper on my desk, it's not, that paper is not going to be hurt by me leaving it there and not touching it. All right. You know, I keep thinking that the office cleaning fairies are going to come in and take care of this pile on my desk. They have not shown up yet. But on the other hand, you really can't use benign neglect with a little USB drive 
or a CD-ROM. That being said, paper isn't perfect either. Uh, my cat is not here in the office. I'm kind of surprised that she isn't, but my cat chews paper like a dog would. She loves to chew paper. So if any of this paper on my desk would, would fall on the floor, she would consider that fair game. So paper is not without its, its downfalls. Plus you have, you have other little creepy crawlies and there's mold and mildew and all sorts of things like that. So paper, you know, I'm a librarian and I have archival training, but paper is not perfect. There, there is, though truth be said, there is no perfect format. Um, let me see here. Oh, this, this sounds awful. Blue Kimchi Andrea says, I've experienced a fire and lost poems that Elvis actually put to music for my mom. Her boyfriend at the time served with him in the army. Oh, what a loss. I'm so sorry. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, Melissa says that's so sad. Um, so Lynn asks, can you download the Roots Web Archive now before they turn it off? Yes, you can go on to uh, rootsweb.com. And at the very top, there's a button that says mailing list. Click on that and you will see, I will show you the little, little screenshot here. If you, if you go into rootsweb.com, at the very top of the page, you'll see this, this button that says mailing lists. That'll take you to this mailing list page and you can find a list, you can search a list. That's how I found that example that I showed earlier of the, uh, of the Bible record that was, that was in there. So yeah, even though Ancestry apparently has said on Roots Web support, that they're going to make this available with a free alternative. There's no date on that. So I would spend the next, you know, between now and April 6th, when they say that this is going away, I would really go and explore these and see what you can find. Yeah, talking about, um, archiving. Ellie says, I just updated two of my external drives to SSD drives. I also use Backblaze to back up my computer as well as using OneDrive. So I do have multiple places that all my data is saved. Excellent. Excellent. So So Ellen says for those of, and I always forget to do this. I always forget to do a little recap in the middle. Um, so for those of us who came in late, can you briefly tell us what Ancestry is deleting? Well, it's all going back to, let me get back to here. Something that was shown that is currently on the, um, on something called Roots Web. I won't recap the whole history. You can catch that at the very beginning of the replay, but here on RootsWeb, which is owned by Ancestry, that they have announced that the mailing lists, which there are almost 33,000 of them, um, that those will be shut down on April 6th of this year. Um, in fairness, they, they actually shut off the ability to send anything to those mailing lists back in 2020. So it's been almost three years since they did that. But what is going to be going away is this wonderful archive of all of those. I would have to think that there are millions of them, millions of these uh, individual emails that went to these more than 32,000 mailing lists. And these were surname mailing lists, location, topic. Basically, if it involved genealogy, there was probably a Roots Web mailing list for it, but possibly losing access to things like Family Bible 
transcriptions and, and abstracts, things like that. So all of us do need to be responsible for what we are doing with our, what we are doing with the records that we find, what we're doing with our research, not relying upon, oh, I found it on Ancestry, Ancestry, I, I will always be able to look at it there. I found it on Family Search, I'll always be able to find it there. Not necessarily, and for a variety of reasons. So ultimately, it does come up to us as researchers, as genealogists, as family historians, to take the steps to preserve what we are finding. And that means getting a copy of that record for ourselves, not relying upon it always being on Ancestry or wherever. Getting that copy, whether it's printing it as a PDF, whether it's downloading the image, whether it's grabbing a screenshot if you have to, but having that image for, having that record for yourself. And then being responsible with safe computing. And by that, I mean having regular backups, having backups in multiple formats in different locations, and really being conscious of the fact that Formats are not forever. Media is not forever. File formats are not forever. So we need to keep it fresh. We don't want to incur that tech debt to where it becomes either too expensive or too onerous to actually make that migration from that very old media or that very old format into something that is current. We all have to be, uh, we all have to be mindful of that. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for for joining me this evening. Hey, if you are watching this, especially if you're watching this on YouTube, if you have enjoyed this, I sure would appreciate it if you would hit that like button. And I produce content like this regularly. So if you want to stay up to date with what's going on in the world of genealogy and want to get some genealogy and family history tips so that you can grow your family tree, uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel as well. Everyone, thank you again for joining me, whether you are watching this live or watching the replay. And I hope that you go out and you make some great discoveries in your family tree. I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.